So I am very pleased to introduce the the head of mechanical engineering, Eckerd Grohl. Thank you very much, John. And it's my pleasure as a head of ME to introduce Amy Marconet. Uh, Amy got her bachelor degree from the University of Wisconsin in 2007. Then she left Wisconsin and uh, moved to Stanford and got a master's in uh, 2009 and then a PhD in 12, 13 type, uh, right? And she joined us here at Purdue uh, in August 2013, uh, coming as an assistant professor, as now associate professor. Uh, very productive and engaging faculty member in ME. Her research area is uh, thermal phenomena heat transfer phenomena in uh, nanostructures, uh, silicon-based uh, type uh, nanostructures, carbon nanotubes, I think some uh, uh, of that stuff. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing more about your experience here at ME. Oh, you have your own microphone, own. right? <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, Amy, please. Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. As uh, Eckerd said, I'm Amy Marconet, and I work in heat transfer and energy conversion. And uh, Abby pointed out some pr stuff before Purdue in her talk. I'm going to go way back and in the uh, uh, holiday season, bring up some of my inspiration to uh, become a mechanical engineer and work on heat transfer. My father is a mechanical engineer, and in the 90s, he worked at Kraft Foods on food safety. And so for about 20 years, every year at Thanksgiving, we have about four thermocouples in our, our uh, turkey. And uh, we record this data of the temperature versus time for cooking. Uh, sometimes we've had some on the grill outside as well in the oven. And I don't know how many of your uh, family traditions involve calibrating your oven, uh, but that's what we'll be doing on Wednesday <laughs> before Thanksgiving. So uh, as, as Professor Grohl mentioned, I grew up in Wisconsin went to University of Wisconsin for undergrad, but I also had some experiences before undergrad. I was able to work in a research lab for two summers as a high school student. And then in undergrad, I worked all four years with Professor Bosky in the Electromagnetics Materials Processing Lab. And uh, that, that, those experiences have really inspired me to do outreach activities and try to get students involved in heat transfer research. I also had to go to classes, and some, these are some of my friends before our last uh, exam in undergrad and getting the chance to go out on the field, uh, and uh, we'll see how this Saturday's game goes. Uh, torn loyalties here. <laughs> but also as an undergrad, I got the experience to go on an internship, and it might seem like destiny, but heat transfer were the two words that got me that job. The uh, interviewer was the vice president of the company, and he had come out uh, to interview uh, students for the, interview, uh, for the internship. And uh, his computer had gotten broken on the plane, so he spent 28 minutes talking about his, uh, his uh, company and what it did, and that left two minutes for me to answer the question, what do you think a mechanical engineer could do for our company? I said heat transfer, and uh, six weeks later, I was in sunny California. And one of my favorite experiences in that uh, research project is shown in this picture, where we were trying to break ceramic windows. And so we successfully or successively worked up from having a, a soldering iron at the middle and water cooling at the edge to this probably very OSHA unsafe experiment where we were melting solder onto the center of the window and we had liquid nitrogen cooling at the outside. Uh, but it, was, it really inspired me that heat transfer, we got to do things that are hands on, we got to see the physics. That's uh, another thing uh, from my dad with the, with the uh, turkey cooking, we got to see the heat. And so that has led me to develop an, a number of outreach activities that we've deployed at the Imagination Station here in town, as well as through the Women in Engineering program and the Duke Energy Academy. And so using a combination of tools ranging from infrared cameras that can attach to your cell phone to uh, thermochromic nail polish and duct tape, we can do activities with these kids ranging in age from uh, you know, two-year-olds who are putting these toys that change color in hot water to cold water, up to these high school students uh, that are building heat exchangers and looking at the performance uh, in, in our real research lab for a couple of days. So uh, along the lines of outreach, I've had a number of undergraduate students work in my research lab. Uh, the bottom is showing a few of their various poster sessions, and uh, the top is the battery of all of them. 
Many of them have gone on to grad school and some have chosen to go on to industry. Uh, Megavin, who's here in the top row, uh, is going to join my lab as a PhD student in January. So I've had some great success with undergrads that in, I think inspiring them to continue to graduate programs. For my own graduate trajectory, I, uh, after much debate, chose to go to Stanford. And I knew that I wanted to work on micro and nanoscale phenomenon, but I wasn't sure quite what. So in the first year of my, my research there, almost like a master's project, I worked on vapor venting heat exchangers for electronics cooling. We called that the bubble side of the group. I then moved on to looking at solid state physics and some of the things that Professor Grohl mentioned, nanoscale phenomenon and silicon nanowires, carbon nanotubes. We have these wonderful laser apparatuses uh, pioneered by people like uh, Sean Fanjou here at Purdue. And we can understand the physics of the energy carriers that move the heat. Uh, this room brings me back to 2012. Uh, because in April of 2012, just before I defended my thesis, I came here and I gave my faculty interview right here at the same podium. Different furniture, but uh, it's like a full circle. Now I have tenure. A month later, or less than a month later, I defended my thesis. And then I went off to Boston and did a postdoc at MIT for one year. I brought in some new measurement techniques uh, through that experience and some uh, experiments related to uh, phase change. So harvesting sunlight and turning it into uh, water vapor that you could use to then desalinate uh, uh, contaminated pools. So all those experiences brought me here to Purdue, and that's, I guess, what we're really here to talk about, how I've gotten through uh, the assistant professor uh, uh, trajectory and on here to the associate. And this is a little uh, chart. I'm an engineer. I love charts. I have probably way too many Excel files but just showing the size of my lab and the distribution of students throughout the years. And none of this work would have been possible without the students. And there's many of them here in the audience today. So thank you guys for coming and for doing great work. Uh, in, in 2013, when I showed up, I had an empty room. By the end of 2013, we'd gotten some equipment in the lab and I had two PhD students, Yu Chang and Collier. Now we have multiple sets of experiments going on. We have this infrared microscope that lets us see the temperature profiles with two micron spatial resolution, a cryostat there in the middle that lets us do experiments down to two, uh, 10 Kelvin, and at various other tools that let me do my job. And uh, including all my st uh, current students and alumni on this slide was hard. I had to look through uh, all our pictures on our website and make Hopefully I didn't miss anybody, but we have a large battery of MTech alumni that have gone off uh, and done great things. And some of the students are current, so just to highlight the current students, again, many of them are in this room, and I appreciate all of their hard work. So what are they doing? What are we doing in our lab? My work, I said, broadly focuses on heat transfer and energy conversion, but why is that important? We're looking at trying to improve heat dissipation or thermal properties of material in order to enable new technology, such as wearable, flexible electronic devices. Uh, you probably all have a cell phone and you've uh, uh, probably felt it heat up during charging or during use, and that really limits the performance of the system. But if you take that cell phone and you try to integrate it into, say, a jacket or, or uh, wearable electronics, the t thermal constraints are even more uh, crucial because it's right in, in good contact with your skin. And so uh, to enable these wearable, flexible devices, we not only need materials that are more flexible than what's in your current rigid cell phone, but we also need materials that can make sure the heat is not being dissipated to your skin and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we don't want anybody to get burned. Along those lines, we also need batteries for next generation electronics and mobile devices. Uh, beyond, ba uh, beyond mobile devices, we also need batteries for uh, electric vehicles and other forms of transportation, energy storage for the grid, and, and all these applications uh, would be helped by being able to charge and discharge more rapidly and to be able to store more power. And so we're doing a lot of work on engineering materials that have good heat transfer characteristics, but not putting the other uh, properties in the back seat. Uh, we need to engineer materials with multifunctional properties to meet the challenges of the electrochemistry, the mechanical requirements, and the heat transfer requirements. And then we're also working on some work related to uh, buildings and energy storage and trying to make uh, our world a little bit more efficient in terms of energy usage. And so I have a new project that started last year using 
uh, metal hydrides for thermochemical energy storage. Don't have time uh, to talk about everything or we'd be here till tomorrow. But I wanted to highlight a few of my works and talk a little bit about my strategy. So in my field, there are, as I, as I said, multiple properties and multiple materials that all have to be integrated together to form these devices. And so in the, in the world of batteries, I just want to point out that we have feature sizes ranging from meter length scales and the ultimate systems that these might be used in down to nanometers and microns for where the actual electrochemical reactions are occurring. And if we don't understand the physics inside the battery cell, we can't understand how we're going to get the heat out at the macro scale. We also have a lot of work scaling, mul uh, uh, scaling multiple length scales uh, in electronics cooling, ranging from the transistors that we're trying to pack more of them into smaller areas, up to data centers that have all of these uh, uh, servers crammed together in rooms, and uh, there's unique challenges with cooling that, uh, that much uh, e energy that's dissipated during those computations. And a number of my research uh, uh, projects have been in collaboration with material scientists. And here, the uh, heat transfer comes into play in two aspects. It comes into play in the processing of the material and how the microstructures evolve, as well as in the use. So this is an example of a project we did with Chrysler. Uh, and the end use of the part will be exposed to uh, very high temperatures. To just highlight some of our experimental techniques, our experimental techniques have been developed in-house for the most part to span these nine or 10 orders of magnitude and length scale, ranging from measurements that we can do on individual nanowires up to system level thermal performance measurements. And this has let us uh, delve into the detailed physics of heat transfer. And to take batteries as an example, we've done modeling and experimental work at the micro scale, looking at how the electrodes are fabricated. We've done work at the mesoscale, once you have the electrodes, trying to understand the thermal properties and the interface resistances inside the cell. And that project eventually got funded by NASA because they were really concerned about the batteries they were sending up to the International Space Station. They had all these high fidelity models of batteries, but the limiting information was that nobody had measured the thermal properties of the interfaces. And so we provided some of the first of kind data for the interfacial resistances inside of battery cells from direct measurements uh, rather than uh, coupling with, with inverse models. And we've also developed some techniques that let us observe the temperature profiles inside of battery cells during charging and discharging. And this work is really novel and, and in progress right now. Switching gears for a moment back to those flexible electronic devices, you might imagine wanting to incorporate electronic devices onto wearables. And we've been looking into different fibers and fabrics that could be good flexible high conductivity materials. And these bridge length scales as well, because the woven fabric is made up of uh, fibers, and those fibers are made up of individual filaments. And so we've had to develop new measurement techniques to understand the heat transfer in these systems and understand their eventual performance. So working with a group at National University of Singapore, we developed a measurement technique to understand thermal conductivity of fibers. And then uh, that led to some collaborations kind of off field of the wearable electronics, but with Tahira Reed on uh, human hair and heat transfer in human hair and the impact on commercial products like fiber, uh, uh, hair straightening irons and things like that. The same measurement techniques that we had developed for the carbon fibers worked in those uh, situations as well. And then lately, we've been working on uh, integrating the fibers up into fabrics. And this work has uh, recently been presented at iTherm. And our student, uh, Aditya, he won, he, he did like a triple crown at iTherm, winning art and science, best paper, and best poster for his work looking at the thermal conductivity of fibers, filaments, and fabrics uh, as a function of length scale and, and different parameters. I have numerous other projects that I don't have time to go into, but you can see some inspiration from that early work on nanoscale phenomena that's still going on in my lab, development of new materials and new measurement techniques, some work on the thermal fluids brought in from my postdoc experience, and then a lot of work that we're doing has been uh, focused on uncertainty quantification in process and metrology. So we're developing a new high temperature thermal characterization tool, and we want to make sure that it gives us 
uh, good, accurate results. And then once you have those results, we can feed them into models such as here of the casting process to understand how uncertainties in your inputs impact the output parameters. Outside of research, I spend a lot of time on teaching. I teach 315, which is our undergraduate heat transfer class, and 505, our graduate heat transfer class. I try to incorporate demonstrations, both live demonstrations and videos, uh, into the class activities and make them more active learning. I often have students work in partners on quizzes and uh, provide review materials online to ensure that they're ga uh, gaining the skills necessary to understand the physics. And I've done a lot of things outside of research as well, both at the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue and for professional organizations. One of the ones I think is most fun is my activities with the ASME K-16 Committee on Heat Transfer and Electronics Equipment. And uh, over the last two years, we've developed an additive manufacturing heat transfer competition. The first year, we had about 10 student designs com uh, compete, eight of which were printed. The second year, we had 20 designs, but we still were only able to print eight. And one of the most interesting things about this competition is if I think, I think if we gave the same prompt to heat transfer engineers, we'd get some very standard designs. But giving it to students who are early in their career who might not have all of the built-in uh, information that we've learned uh, through experience, they come up with very creative designs that take advantage not only of the heat transfer in the system, but the unique capabilities of additive manufacturing. All of my work would not have been possible without mentors here at Purdue as well as collaborators. And I wanted to thank a few in particular, uh, Professor Hahn, who is here, uh, made a special effort in the first year to uh, take me and some other junior colleagues to lunch once a week, and that really helped to make me feel part of the community here. Uh, and some of my peers, uh, Liang and Ivan, have been instrumental at reading proposals, especially at last minute, and providing feedback uh, to make sure that we have some successes uh, in our peer group as well. And a lot of collaborators, both here at Purdue and around the world, have been instrumental in providing materials for us to uh, explore new heat transfer physics. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for coming to my talk, and I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Amy. Wonderful presentation. Any questions? OK, so I'm pretty familiar with your work uh, <laughs> already. So I'm going to ask a, uh, a frivolous question, which is, did the, doc, did the instrumentation improve the turkey? Did the instrumentation improve and, the turkey? And how do you quantify that? <laughs> so I, I guess the instrumentation uh, it made sure that we cooked turkeys safely. A lot of people still have mm. frozen insides and hot outsides. My dad was a pretty good cook before he started putting the thermocouples in the turkey. Uh, but he wanted that added confirmation. So I'll tell you, he's most proud of the years that he can set the oven temperature to the right temperature and not have to adjust it such that the turkey is ready at the halftime of the football game. <laughs> so there's multiple objectives he's trying to optimize because we don't know how fast that football game is going to go. <laughs> right. <laughs> Any other questions? Amy, what's the next big thing for you here at Purdue? What, uh, how can the school or the college or the university help you as an uh, associate professor now to achieve that next big thing? That's a really good question. I think in the, in the short term, I'm kicking off some new projects. Again, the thermal chemical energy storage is one that's just starting. Uh, we have one project related to that on buildings and a new one that's starting relating to thermal chemical energy storage for hypersonics. Uh, but I really think the next uh, big thing that the university is going to provide me with is a sabbatical <laughs> so that I can uh, <laughs> learn some more things that will add even, even better skills uh, and, and research directions to my lab. So I, I definitely will take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah, that's approved. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, I'm outside of the field, so I don't know much. But could you s briefly explain the difference? I think you work really mostly on micro scale, right? And how does the heat transfer from micro scale different from, from like a macro scale, or uh, let's say the heat transfer of the building or concrete? 
Yeah. I'll yeah. So I, I was going to go into that detail, and then I took it out, try to make it a little more high level. But just to uh, use this length scale again, uh, when you look at a material at bulk, the thermal conductivity is just a property of the material. You can uh, measure it and quantify how well heat moves uh, given a, a fixed temperature difference. When you get to the micro scale, the energy carriers that actually move the heat start to be important. And so those, those will be electrons in metals and phonons, which are atomic vibrations in nonmetals. And uh, really, in all materials, uh, both contribute, but the, the weighting is different. And so as we start to shrink the length scale, we have to start to understand how the energy carriers impact, uh, are impacted by the boundaries of the system. So uh, one reason we use the term uh, nanoscale physics is that at room temperature in a variety of materials, the length scale on which the size of the system starts to impact the thermal properties is around a micron. So if you're above a micron, you can use those bulk parameters and the length scale doesn't matter. If you're below a micron, you have to think about the scattering and impacts of the boundaries on the performance of the system. But if we go to cold temperatures, if we go to cryogenic temperatures, we see the same phenomenon on centimeter to meter length scales, depending on the material. So astronauts going to space in the 60s uh, first were uh, kind of to, to uh, see this in practice with like aluminum sheets that had millimeter spacings. Uh, you could see the, the microscale physics or nanoscale physics that we're exploring. And so sometimes we do our experiments at the very low temperatures so that we can use larger sizes to see the same effect. OK, any other questions? Oh, once. All right, well, Amy, thank you very much again for your presentation, for answering questions.